Thank you all for coming. I'm Phil Nash. My uh, Twitter handle down there, uh, in case you want to follow me. And uh, you'll see it again at the end, just in case you want to unfollow me by that point. So I'm developer advocate at JetBrains. Uh, we had a booth all week, but that's finished now, so you missed your chance. But you can catch me or any of my uh, colleagues uh, for the rest of the week um, afterwards. But obviously, we're not going to talk about that now. We are going to talk about error handling. Hopefully, that was obvious from, from the title. In fact, we're going to talk about the, the future of error handling in C++, or the possible futures, um, with a little bit of uh, historical context as well. Now, I forgot to do my 60-second uh, my um, transition, so I'll have to uh, talk a little bit more um, as that goes through. Actually, this, uh, this photo was taken um, from the, the JetBrains uh, Christmas party last year. We actually went out to the Austrian Alps uh, to, to have a party out there. And I took this photo from, from the hotel window. I thought, let's make a nice little backdrop, backdrop on the same. Um, I don't think I can get past it without the next 30 seconds or so. Um, but it's a nice picture. <laughs> I like it. Um, here we go. I really should rethink that strategy, shouldn't I? <laughs> so, this is actually a new era for me. Another nine seconds left. There we go, finally. So, a little bit of historical context that I wanted to talk about, because we're going to be talking about this proposal. So it's obviously still the future at the moment. This is P0709. Many of you have heard of this by now. Uh, Herb's going to be talking about it more in his keynote. Um, and obviously, the, it's got Herb's name on the paper, as, long as, as well as uh, many other people. I actually did a, a talk on this proposal last year. Uh, optional is not a failure. Some of you may have seen that. You can consider this talk the sequel to that one. So if you haven't seen that talk, some of the, the initial details may seem a bit light because we're going to dig into more of the supporting proposals uh, and some of the um, sort of deeper underlying things. Um, but we are going to look a little bit at some of the, the, the context again and um, a little bit of a summary. Now, interestingly, this is not actually the first talk that I've done with that title. I did this one. So same title, optional is not a failure, but this was actually at a mobile conference and it was in the context of Swift. And the reason I bring that up is because this is where I first had the idea for this subject matter, because uh, one of the statements I made during that talk was that I believe that Swift has probably the most advanced error handling strategy of any programming language today. And that's quite a bold claim. But when I made that statement in front of all these Swift developers, um, I could see them all nodding their heads in, in agreement. It's, it's, uh, it's actually really, really done a really good job of error handling. And my idea was to try and bring some of these ideas to the C++ community. So I proposed the same talk at the C++ conferences. And then, before I actually gave the first version, I heard about Herb's proposal, which was basically to do exactly that. So what we're going to see is something very much like uh, Swift's error handling in C++. But that history I wanted to talk about. So it's not the first time I've looked at alternate error handling strategies in C++. So who, who here has heard of exploding return types? Uh, just a couple of hands, yeah. So it's a bit of an old idea now, and for various reasons, um, we don't really do this anymore. <coughs> but I think I first heard about it from a talk by Andre Alexandrescu back in 2007. Uh, choose your poison, exceptions or error codes. Uh, you know, discussing the trade-offs between the two and how we might want to try and get the best of both worlds. And um, the talk's focused around this template, likely T. And there's a couple of interesting properties of this template. Uh, the first one, which we'll dig more into a bit later, is that it represents either the, or holds either the value actually wanted to return or some uh, exception type. But for the purpose of our discussion right now, this bit is interesting. If you haven't actually checked uh, the, the value or error code before it goes out of scope, the destructor actually throws the exception. So hence the exploding return type. So it forces you to actually deal with it. Although, you know, obviously it's not perfect because it's still a runtime thing. We have better ways of doing that now. Um, it turns out that wasn't even the first version of this. Uh, I, I dug back in um, the Comp Lang C++ moderated 
Around 2000, it was being discussed. Um, this one by uh, Ken Hagen here. Again, you can see the destructor throwing if, if the, uh, the type is not being checked. Um, and that even referenced earlier work, uh, particularly by uh, Lisa Lippincott, who was in that same thread, uh, chipping in. And I really like this, this comment that she made. Let's not repeat the mistakes of the past. Model the copy construction and assignment of the current auto pointer and not the old broken one. <laughs> Simpler times we lived in, eh? So this idea has been around for a long time, but let's say it's not really what we do today. So fast forwarding a little bit, 2012, Alexandre Estri again, doing another talk, systematic error handling in C++. And in this talk, he presented a very similar template. And it's not a great um, a slide there, so I pulled the original out. <coughs> and you can see it's still got this idea of containing either the, the value you wanted or an exception in this case but it doesn't have this exploding return type. So it's distilled down to that, that essential uh, property. And what did he call this type? Expected T. And it says expected T is either a T or the exception preventing its creation. So it might all sound a bit familiar because of course we, we now have this proposal, stood expected, P0323, I don't think it actually made it into 20 in the end, in the end but I think it's still, still on the table. And that is really just the evolution of the ideas that um, uh, Andre originally proposed. But these are not new ideas to programming languages in general. Uh, just to pick a few languages uh, that I have some familiarity with, they have very similar types. Uh, most of them are called result. Uh, Haskell's case is a bit more general. You've got the either monad. But they're all doing the same thing. Um, have, they have the type you actually wanted or some sort of error type, um, which may or may not be an exception type. Interestingly, the Swift one there says they only got this result type since Swift 5, which actually came out earlier this year. And if you remember, I said that I felt that Swift's error handling was you know, about the best in any programming language right now. That's because I think Swift actually leapfrogged ahead to where we want to be. And this is really just a stepping stone, and it turned out to be useful to go back to it for other reasons, mostly asynchrony and some things like that, which we might get to later. So it's quite a, a common idea that we're all sort of converging on, this uh, stepping stone, as I say. So let's have a look at how that works. <coughs> so here's an example function, uh, just to parse a string into an integer. And the significant part, forget the fact that it's using IO streams, doesn't matter. It's the, the return type is stood expected of int, which is the type we wanted, or I've used an exception here, stood domain error, but it could be any, any type you want to represent the error. Um, so you know, exactly what we were talking about earlier. The return for the, for the error case is this uh, return uh, stood make unexpected. And it's got this little sort of factory function wrapper uh, just to make uh, overloading work nicely. So when you return the actual value, you don't have to, to wrap that one. Um, but really, that's all it's doing. It's just returning the, the unexpected. So that's all pretty straightforward. Uh, I think we readily understand what this is doing. Let's have a look at um, how we'd use that, how we'd call that. So calling parse in down here, um, capturing the result. We test it. You can see it works very much like um, std optional, which sort of models a pointer. So you can, you can test it using the explicit Boolean conversion operator. And you can dereference it using the, the star operator. Um, of course, if it doesn't have the value in there, that's going to throw that exception. But then in the error path at the bottom is where it differs from optional. If it was optional, that you'll be done. You know, you just have to muddle along. But this one actually gives you the error type that you returned. And because here it was an exception, we can do dot what on it, but it can be any type you want, as we said. So again, pretty straightforward, fairly uh, easy to understand, I think. And really, this is just giving us what we always had with um, error codes, but now we're not blocking the return channel. We can return other values as well, and it sort of forces us to deal with it. You might want to throw a no discard in there as, as well. I'll talk about that sort of thing a lot more in my, my previous talk. So, great. So what's, what's the problem? Well, this is the problem. See, that's the, uh, the happy path, and in fact, on this screen, you can't see, I've also highlighted the error path in red. <laughs> For some reason, it hasn't come out. But the rest of the code basically is the, the error path, the boilerplate just associated with error handling. 
dom it's already dominating even this smallest of examples. It's all mixed in together. There's no separation. As we might be used to with, with exceptions, where you get that nice clean separation. So that, that's a real problem, I think, because um, especially when you scale this up, in fact, let's do that. Let's add another function. We want to compose with that. So here's another function that takes, uh, in this case, two integers and returns a um, stood expected again. Uh, so don't worry too much about it. It's doing a silly um, division by zero check, uh, just for the sake of the, the example. So let's put that one up there. And we're throwing another function as well. Oop, too far. Uh, this one's not got any error handling. It's just taking an int and, and returning an int. But we want to compose these three functions together while, while taking into account the error handling. So we'd write code something like this. Now, it's reasonably easy to follow. So there's nothing complex going on, but it's really messy. So the, the error handling is really, really dominating now. And you've got this heavy nesting. The, um, the happy path ends up sort of right in the middle of it somewhere. It's difficult to follow the flow at a glance. So that, that's how bad it gets. Now, you might be able to clean up a little bit by using early returns, if that's an option. It doesn't actually help that much, a bit. So yeah, I'm still not that keen on, on this solution, although I like the idea of it. And one thing I dug into a lot more in the previous talk was um, implications such as um, performance costs uh, of exceptions versus stood expected, and uh, uh, the, the runtime costs in terms of image size and all those sorts of things we talked about before. So I'm going to assume you're on board with this is this is the better solution for those purposes. But this is the cost that we have to deal with. Now remember I put up that list of other languages that had similar things in them earlier. Uh, some of those are functional languages, or at least they have some functional elements. Um, how do they deal with, with this sort of problem? Well, I brought up functional programming, so you probably guess, of course, the answer does involve monads. So we are now have a, a, a half an hour session on what a monad is. No, we're not. We're just going to talk about what that's going to give us. So there's another proposal. Now, this is in terms of std optional, but it applies equally to std expected. And uh, the author would, would fully expect to, to a std expected version as well. So monadic operations for, in this case, std optional. Um, what are they? Let's have a look what the abstract says. It says, <clears throat> I propose adding transform and then and or else member functions to std optional or std expected to support this monadic style of programming. So what do these functions actually do? If you do have a bit of a functional programming background, um, you might recognize these as map, bind. And what about the or else? In the context of error handling, this is very close to what we might call a catch. It's the thing that actually deals with the error at the end. So you can already see how we're pushing the error handling to a separate block and using these methods to compose the, the happy path steps. So let's go back to our example and see how that will play out. So that was the one with, with the early return, so really slightly better. If it could use those magnetic methods, it would look more like that. I think you can agree, just from that slide transition, just how much that actually saves you in terms of boilerplate. And also, once you get used to the style, you can you know, readily see the flow of data going through. And I haven't put the, the uh, or else block in there, but that would just be tagged on the end. So that's a big improvement. But you know what? It's still not good enough. There's still a fair bit of boilerplate on there. And this is the bleeding edge of C++. This is a, a proposal on top of a proposal that we don't have yet. And, and we're still not really there. So I think that's a, that's a bit of a problem. Yeah. Just to compare that against what we already have in C++, which is exceptions. That's what we would do with exceptions. Just do that again. So that's our best efforts looking forward to the future. And that's with exceptions. It's so much lighter weight. So what we want to do, of course, is have our cake and eat it. So what would this look like with P0709, Herb's proposal that we were talking about earlier? Well, basically that. And in fact, you see that try keyword there? 
that part's optional. And currently, the committee is not favouring it. I'm still hopeful. We'll discuss what that means in a minute. But that, that, that doesn't even have to be there. So basically, it looks almost exactly as like exceptions that we have today. But the interesting property is it has all of the performance and other characteristics of the stood expected version. And if you want to know how it does that, well, first of all, you need to see the previous talk. And in the second half of this talk, we're going to dig into all the, the uh, other aspects that support how that works. But first, let's look a little bit more about how this syntax works. Here's the, uh, the interesting moving parts. So there's this additional throws qualifier on the, the function signature. So it's not like the deprecated throw keyword. And in fact, that was proposed at one point, resurrect that for this purpose. That was felt to be too confusing, so it's throws. Um, so that just means that this, this function throws. But you can think of that as being the equivalent of saying, transform the return type into stood expected of the value or the type and some error type. Discuss what the error type is soon. And again, we have um, throw. It looks just like throw we have today, except we're throwing a value type here. In fact, as we'll see in a moment, that's actually just an enum value rather than a, an exception type. And then we have that optional try keyword. Let's say it's not actually necessary, but when you combine that with the froze keyword, the advantage that has is it actually makes exceptions visible in the code. It makes it easier to reason about where exceptions may, may come from. And I think Herb might talk a bit more about this in, in his keynote, so I won't <coughs> go into it too much here, other than to say I'm strongly in the camp where I, I think this is a good idea. Um, but we'll, we'll see how that goes in the, uh, in the committee. All right, let's um, add a bit more code down here. Let's say we're, we're composing this into, into another function. So that function itself can also have the froze keyword. Uh, whether you have the try keyword or not, this can all be statically checked by the compiler. So if you're in a function that's not marked froze, and you call a function that is frozen, one of these new style exceptions. I mean, potentially it could actually give you a compile error, but the proposal is it will actually go into this interoperability mode where it will transform these new style exceptions into old style and, and the other way around. Again, I went into that more previously, um, but there is a, an interoperability story there. So, scaling up a little bit more, to use them in normal try catch blocks. I say normal. But the catch block, again, we're catching that value type. And now you can see the type is std error. Um, big part of this talk is going to be discussing what std error actually is and how that works. But for now, think of it as just a simple value type. You can see it's got a dot message on there, but it's, it's incredibly lightweight. Now, the next slide, I want to really sort of uh, try and um, drill home exactly what's going on here, or at least as if. We need to think of everything we've just seen as being isomorphic to the, the sort expected example, just with a lot less syntax. So the, uh, the throws and the, um, uh, the, the return type could be transformed into stood expected of that type and stood error. Of course, the return type may be void. That's fine. The, um, the throw is the equivalent of returning sake, uh, stood make unexpected. And even that try keyword, the optional try keyword that some people are complaining about as being, you know, three characters too many, that's standing in for, in, even in the, the best case, our magnetic operators, the, the and then and the, the transform. It's doing a lot of work for you. In fact, we may get all of that for free. But if you think of them as being equivalent, and they're not exactly equivalent, there's some differences, but conceptually they're, they're doing the same thing. You can start to see how we get the performance benefits and the, um, the image size benefits, as well as being a bit easier to reason about. All right, well, go back to our example. We mentioned this type, stood error. And this is really where the magic happens. And um, it's not really being widely discussed outside of the, the committee yet. So I wanted to take a bit of time to actually drill into what this is, how it works, and, and why it's actually really useful. So here's the proposal. So P1028, by the way, I'm going to talk about a lot of these proposals today. There will be references at the end, so get them all in one place. So 
It says it's a status code and standard error object. And this is for P0709 zero overhead deterministic exceptions. So it's obviously intended to be a supporting paper, but don't let that fool you. This paper stands on its own and will be really useful even completely separately from P0709 <coughs> for reasons hopefully will become clear. So what is it? The proposal starts off by saying, a, a proposal for the replacement in new code of the system header system error with a substantially refactored and lighter weight design, which meets modern C++ design and implementation. So it's referencing something we already had, system error. Who, who here is familiar with system error? Yep, only a few hands, always the same. But we've had this since C++ 11, and it's actually already really useful, and we should be using it more. There should be greater awareness of it. This is just fixing some of the deficiencies of it, and we're gonna go into what those are. But first of all, I'm gonna explain what system error is, or the uh, stood error code is the, uh, the type we're interested in. So um, let's have a look at stood error first. So one thing I need to do to clear up, some of these names are similar. It can be difficult to remember what we're talking about. So stood error is the newly proposed type. And this is what it is. Hopefully that makes it all clear. <laughs> so it's a type def using um, a statement for this error status code, array system code value type. So we're gonna break that up and, and have a look what it is. Uh, but before we do that, before we look into what those are, so I wanna go back to C++ 11 and look at stood error code. So this is the old one, the one that we currently have in the standard. We need to understand this before we can understand stood error. So what is it? Um, this is sort of a sketch of, of what it is. There's a lot more to it, but this is the state. So it just has an integer value and a pointer to something called an error category. Um, that's it. So you can already see how this is quite lightweight. This will fit in two registers. So it's got plenty of methods, but these are the important ones, I think. There's a, there's a couple there that are just accessors. So getting the int out, and getting the error category out by reference, but it's, it's just the same thing, really. But then the other two methods, uh, message, it's returning a string. Where's that coming from? And the, the Boolean operator, you can probably guess how that works. Unfortunately, you probably guessed wrong. We'll see why in a moment. What's this error category? Most people, when they try to explain error category, they say it's like a domain for errors which it is. In which case, why don't we just call it error domain? It would be so much easier. So anyway, the domains are just the spaces that these enums live in. Don't have to be enums, but they usually are. Uh, but this is what will be convertible to that integer. So th the integer value is really gonna be a, an entry in one of these enums. So there's, there's one that's actually defined in the standard as, alongside um, error code, which is this RC enum. And these are just all the POSIX codes. So all the POSIX codes, error codes, are actually in the standard. <coughs> you can use them today. But you can also define your own error categories, uh, such as this really, really useful one up here. But if you do that, you need to define your own error category class. So it's just a polymorphic class. Uh, so you derive something from error category, and you have to overload a number of virtuals. So message there, you can see how now how the, it's getting the string out, it's actually forwarding onto the error category. The error category knows how to interpret the integer as an enum, so it can do whatever it needs to do to make that into a string. Your lookup table, switch statement, string conversion, whatever. Uh, it's entirely up to you, because you're in control of the error category and how that works. And then you've got these methods called equivalent. There's a couple of overloads there. What do they do? It turns out that when you are dealing with error codes from different error categories, it's really useful to be able to compare error codes from different error categories. For example, if you've got one in your own custom domain or category, you might want to compare them with error codes in the, uh, the, the POSIX category. But how does that work? Well, that's, that's what you define in these equivalence methods. And that allows you to do not just one-to-one, -one, but one-to-many, many-to-many, and or have lots of gaps. Whatever makes sense for your error category, and we usually are just comparing to the um, uh, see 
uh, error category. Whatever makes sense, you can do that. And then you can, you can compare errors in some ca custom category that you don't know anything about with the error category that you do, and the chances are it's going to work as you expect. It's actually a really powerful concept. Why have we got these overloads, though? Well, it turns out there's two ways of doing this. One is where you actually want to do um, equivalents like here. And the other one is where you want to do just a direct, you know, bit by bit comparison. So if there are different categories, it's, they're not going to compare equal. And the way that's defined to work in the old, the old system is if you have this error condition type. An error condition is basically exactly the same as error code, but it's just a different type for overloading purposes. That's all it is which sounds reasonable until you actually try to use it and it gets very confusing in practice. So that's, that's one of the problems. You know, why, why have this whole separate type just for overloading? So that's, that's really all there is to it, for error, error code. It's quite straightforward. Um, as I say, the fact that so many people are not familiar with it, I think is um, a little bit sad because this is a really useful type. Hopefully it's gonna become much more useful. So here's the summary of some of the problems with it that we're going to try and solve. We've already talked about some of them. Um, one of them is that because of the way these error category pointers are, are defined, the, um, to, to compare two error categories, you have to do it by points of value. And that means essentially they have to be singletons. And in some circumstances, I think it's basically single, um, the header-only libraries within a dynamic library it tends to mean that these singletons will have different addresses for the same, same singleton. So that breaks down. So that's, that's a problem. We mentioned that that message returns a string. Seems fair enough. You know, it's a standard type. What's the problem there? But it turns out that's actually quite a heavyweight dependency. That pulls in um, often IO streams, uh, locales, uh, even exceptions, uh, which is a real shame because often this type is used in cases where you want to avoid all that stuff. <laughs> Uh, particularly in embedded and heavily constrained systems, for example. So that's a bit of a problem. And uh, one of the things that the SG14 study group has raised. Remember I said that that Boolean conversion probably doesn't do what you think? It's actually worse than that. It will often do what you think it should do, and then other times it won't. What it's defined as doing is just telling you whether the that value, which is um, maps onto one of your enums, is zero or not. So depending on your error category, that might mean it's not an error, or it might mean something entirely different. Depends on the category. So it's almost completely useless, unfortunately. Um, we mentioned we need that separate error condition type for overloading purposes for this equivalence, which is a bit confusing. This was all defined in C++ 11. Um, when we had very minimal consexpra, so pretty much none of it is, is consexpra. It all could be. And the, the error code can only be an integral type, so it's fine for enums, but for a more general solution, that, that could be a bit limiting as well. Um, and we also mentioned, yeah, the categories are actually domains. That's an easier thing to, to teach. So these are the problems that this paper is going to try and address. So let's have, have a look at how it does that. So here's the, ma the main type, the main template that the, the proposal uh, proposes. So status code. So this, you can see immediately, looks very similar to error code, except it's a template. So that fixes the problem of it being constrained to in integral types. Um, you can also see we fixed the problem with the naming. We now have a status code domain instead of category. Uh, but other than that, it looks pretty similar. So let's bring up that using uh, alias that we looked at earlier. You can see we're not quite there to matching this up yet because we've introduced status code, but we're actually talking about error status code. And the difference is actually simply this. An error status code is one that's guaranteed to always be only an error. So it'll never be success. And it just enforces that in its constructor. And that means the Boolean conversion thing is, is completely moot. In fact, they've taken out the Boolean conversion. That's just problematic. But in the case of error codes, you want them to always represent an error. And so this guarantees that. So that simplifies things a bit. And then you've got the other bits. You've got the um, erased 
uh, system code value type. You could probably guess that erased is some sort of type erasure mechanism, and it is. But what about the system code value type? Well, system code value type is, in our case, defined to be something effectively like int pointer t. So think of it as int pointer t. <coughs> and being a template type to erased, it's telling erased to make its storage for its erased type as big as that, that type. So setting aside memory the size of an int pointer t to put something into, which could be an enum, an integer, or of course a pointer. So that's actually slightly more general than, than we had before with just the integer, and actually more useful in our case. So it's fine for just stuffing integers in. You can also put pointers in. So that's good. So effectively, we can boil that template down to this. It's, uh, it's got the, the status code domain and an in pointer t, or something as big as an in pointer t that we can put other stuff into. So filling out the, the other blanks. Well, we mentioned domains and are called domains. Uh, what we didn't mention is that rather than looking at the, the pointer value as the identity for the domains, they're actually assigned randomized uh, uint64s uh, at design time. And if you look at the algorithm, it's pretty much guaranteed to never clash, so you don't need to worry about that. Uh, you stick the number in, and then it's always going to be unique. We don't need to compare pointer values. Fixes that problem. As we mentioned, the value can be any small, trivially copyable, or movable type. We'll look at what that means in a moment. There's no sort of string dependency. And we didn't really look at that, but this is one part of the proposal that I think is going to have a little bit of trouble getting through the committee. But as it's currently written, it defines its own string ref type for the purpose of getting rid of this dependency. There's various ways we're going to address that, and hopefully we'll, we'll get something through that doesn't have the stood string dependency, but that, that's what it's trying to do. It's mostly const expert now. Everything that could be const expert is, so that's good. As we said, we've done the Boolean conversion. We don't need it in our case for our purpose. In the general case, um, you're not fooled by it, at least. And we also removed this need for a separate type. Comparison with the equals operator is always equivalence. Because it turns out that's always what we want anyway. If you do want a bit by bit check, you can just uh, check the, um, uh, the the individual values themselves rather than using the equals operator. So some simple fixes mostly for all those problems to make a, a really useful type even more useful. So I'm actually quite excited about this this proposal. Let's dig a little bit more into some of this though. We can see hopefully that this type will fit into two registers because of the way it's defined. Um, I've got this comment on here that if move is equal to mem copy, and it, this is an interesting comment, because if, if the compiler can prove that moving one of these types could be done just by mem copying the bits, then fitting these into registers mean, means you only have to copy registers around. You don't have to call move constructors or anything like that. So that's quite important. But because of that type erasure especially, the compiler can't prove that on its own because it doesn't know what the, the actual type is going to be. So that's where another proposal comes in. In fact, there's two. This one is uh, P1029, move relocates. And then there's another one, P1144, object relocation in terms of move plus destroy. So if we look at them both side by side because I think that's the most effective way to, to see what they're doing. So you can see the first one, move relocates. All it does is defines an attribute that indicates whether moving that type that's um, annotating is trivial, as in it can be done just by mem copying the bits. Simple as that, just the attribute. Whereas P1144, it has an attribute, but it's optional, but it also has additional things, like a detection trait, um, it's got this, this thing where you can um, you can reset the move from state by mem copying from a default constructed instance, which seems fair enough. But that effectively makes this a destructive move paper, which had a long and torturous history going through the committee. So that's one of the reasons that this may get stuck. 
um, which is the whole reason for the first paper. If the second one doesn't get through, we can fall back to the first one and we can still get what we need. And there's some other things in there as well, some algorithms and stuff. Um, go and read the paper if you want to find out more, so there will be links. But coming back to our example, we've uh, discussed now what std error actually is. Hopefully you can see now that this is a really useful but simple type that is also incredibly lightweight. Now, if you remember that we said that this is effectively isomorphic to a std expected of our type and std error, a std error can fit into two registers. Now, one advantage to doing this in the compiler that we haven't really discussed is that we get an additional optimization advantage. With uh, we've still expected there has to be some extra value that indicates, you know, whether it's a value or an error, some discriminator. When we're just using uh, these static exceptions um, on the return channel, the compiler knows there's an unused bit in one of the registers that it can use as a discriminator, which means this probably takes up no additional overhead over just returning the value, which is actually really interesting, depending on the size of your uh, your return type, of course, but. Effectively, no overhead uh, in size, over no error handling, not just over some other type of error handling. So there's that. And if it is an error, you only have to copy two registers around. So you can see how lightweight and, and performant that, that should be. Now, there's no implementation yet, so we haven't verified our assumptions about this, but it, it looks pretty good. And in fact, all of this is effectively what Swift does as well. It's been doing it for about four years now. And that's been working out really great for them. Doesn't always translate across languages, but I think in this case, we're close enough that we can expect to see the same sorts of uh, gains. So I, that's why I'm really excited about this and how this all works. Let's just um, summarize the proposals we looked at. So the top level one, P0709, AKA static exceptions. Um, Herb will tell us more about that in his keynote or you can read, uh, go and watch my previous talk. The, the status code proposal, P1028, uh, AKA stood error. And then the two move relocate papers. Well, we've also talked about stood expected, P0323, and the monadic operations pa uh, proposal. So that's just for optional at the moment. There should be a parallel one for um, stood expected when that comes along. And one we didn't mention, and not just because it was taken out, but contracts also play into this. And the reason I say that is because it turns out that a lot of places in the standard library that currently use exceptions, it's been decided should actually be contracts. And if we make that change, there's very few places left in the standard library that throw exceptions. And most of those are allocation failures. And there's another optional part of uh, P0709 that's getting a lot of attention, where we're saying that actually allocation failure probably shouldn't be an exception either. Uh, we, we're not going to go into this now. I talked about that before. I think Herb might talk about it as well. Um, so contracts are the, the big missing piece here. Because if we take out all those uses of exceptions from the standard, there's very little left. And if you make them this new, new style of static exceptions, then I think being able to see in the code the, the flow of exceptions using that optional try keyword suddenly becomes much more compelling. And uh, I think you need to see it in that context to really appreciate that. So honorable mention to contracts there. Shame we didn't make it into C++20, I think for the right reasons. That's another story. Hopefully we should get it in time for taking part in this, this though. And that actually seems to be all I have to say, um, I did mention the, the, all the references for all those proposals and, and, other, and other things. They're on my website, uh, levelofindirection.com slash refs slash dawn.html. Uh, if you can't remember that, I've also got extra level of indirection that redirects there. Uh, or you can find me on Twitter. And thank you very much. And actually finished much earlier than usual, which makes me think I missed something. So any questions?
Hi. So thank you for your great talk. I was just wondering, so what is this? Why is it an int pointer, an int putter? So what's the pointer used for? What can you use it for? Ah, I did miss something. Thank you. <laughs> so um, you were, were mic'd, but I'll repeat the question, just make sure I've, I've understood it. You wanted to know why uh, it was significant that the, the type became int pointer, whereas it was int previously. Um, so int is not guaranteed to be able to hold all pointers, whereas int pointer is. And the reason that's significant for our purposes is because while we talked about it, um, just conveying enums in still error code, for interoperability with exceptions, it can hold an exception pointer. So if in a, a static exceptions function, it calls something that will throw a dynamic exception, it wraps that in an exception pointer, sticks that inside an error code, and propagates it along. Or you can also use it for your own sort of arbitrary payloads. But at that point, you're paying the cost, of course, of you know, uh, the dynamic allocation. But you don't have to. So by default, we're just dealing with error codes. But you can actually put arbitrary sized objects in there as well by pointer. But, but how is it then going with like, who is deallocating this thing? Deallocation is a topic for another talk, I expect. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't I imagine it's something to do with the error domain, but, um, but I don't know the answer to that one. Good question. OK, so I have two questions. Uh, okay. The first is that this new syntax for try and catch looks very similar to, to the old. Sorry, not, not quite hearing you. Yeah. So this new syntax for try and catch looks uh, so similar to, to the old one, it almost looks like we could just translate our programs, the old programs that use dynamic exceptions to, to this new way. Is that the intention, uh, or is there some work being done to, to make our programs translatable to new so static exceptions? Uh, still struggle to hear everything you said, but I think you were asking whether, because the, the try-catch blocks are basically the same, whether we could just effectively have a compiler mode where it makes old-style exceptions behave like the new ones. Um, and that, that has been talked about, and there may be something in it, but I think they, they work fundamentally differently enough that it is worth having, you know, being explicit in, in the code about it. But that, that's not completely given. That There may be, may be a way to do that. Uh, you said you have two questions. OK, so the other question is that after uh, Andre's talks and, and Chandler's zero cost abstraction is, is kind of a you know, bold claim. So do you really think this is a zero cost abstraction or a low cost abstraction? Well, th this has been, uh, it's been said that this may actually be a negative cost abstraction. But yeah, it all depends what you're measuring against. Um, as I say, compared to no error handling, if you're adding error handling, no matter how lightweight, that's going to have some cost. But compared to all the mechanisms in common use today, um, I think the only thing that could possibly beat it would just be return codes. But then you have there's other trade-offs. Um, but it may even be better than return codes, depending on how the optimizer works. So, so I'm not sure I entirely agree with the, the premise. But um, again, until we actually get an implementation and, and can measure it in, in practice, uh, it's, it's premature to say just how much of a, an overhead, if any, there is. OK, thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk. I also have two questions. The first one is uh, one of the overheads of, ex of exceptions wasn't just its runtime, but its uh, verbosity. When you, when you want to inspect the call itself directly at the place of the call, uh, could it be possible to, to add to one of the proposals that you can do an if on the try function instead of doing the try and catch. Um, maybe even without an additional keyword to the language. You understand what I'm asking? Because we, we, then we really have it all. <laughs> we, we wouldn't have the, ver all the verbosity of the try catch uh, all around the uh, call. Yeah, I, I do think there are definitely cases where you want to do the, the so-called local handling. Yeah. Um, and in fact, in, in Swift, you could do exactly that. There are extra operators. Uh, I think if you do question mark operator, it effectively converts it into an optional. So then you can do an if on that. Uh, and there's, there's a few other ways you can do it in, in Swift. Uh, that's not currently in the proposal as written now. Um, and that's something I would like to see. So I, I might even write something to, to add to that myself later. Um, there's definitely people that have been asking about that. That's one of the most common questions I get. So I do hope to see it. I don't see any reason why that couldn't be easy to put in. 
but it's not in the proposal as it stands now. Okay, and the second question is that that domain thingy, that that pointer, I uh, uh, expect that's also um, a polymorph polymorphic class. So we do have virtual functions, an RTTI, oh, yes. and all that ugliness with it. So it's not so free. Uh, maybe also in addition to 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 the um, to the proposal that somehow even even if we, RTTI is used in the program. I guess nobody cares about. Uh, we'll do. We'll use dynamic casts on ca on domains or mm -hmm. previous and categories, so as to force a mandate in the st in the standard that we don't get those records in our bin binary. Not not only for binary size. Maybe I, I simply don't want uh, an end an end user inspecting m the names of my types. And also, uh, I think the problem was with the error code, or the, the categories, was that. Uh, we uh, in, in today's world we still still uh, often have to link statically with the runtime on Android, for example, or on Windows, or when you build for all Linuxes like CentOS, and then you get all the categories because they're singletons inside your ban binary. So s to somehow tweak the the the, pr um, the language of the proposals to force the vendors not 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 to leave it for the quality of implementation, but to force them that you don't pay for what you don't use. You understand my question? Um, I so didn't completely follow the, the second the part, but just addressing the first part first. And I, I think you sort of answered your own question that um, that there's some, uh, there is some overhead potentially with the virtual functions, but you only pay for them if you use them. And the only, you would only need them if you want to convert the error to a string or if you want to do an equivalence comparison across domains. Otherwise, you can just compare the, the, the raw integer um, error code directly. Without the cost of the virtual overhead, so yeah. So I but, think, uh, but as soon as as soon as it's it inside your program, even if you don't call the virtual function, the RTTI data will be placed in your binary. That's what I'm. One of the things that I said, if we could somehow f force the compiler or or the or the STL standard that allow at least allows or forces the vendors, uh, so that RTTI data isn't generated for for the domain classes. Just something um, to think about, maybe. Yeah, A and also so that they can remove the the unused domains from 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 your binary. Okay. Yeah. So, I think I understand what you're saying now. Um, we'll think about that some more. Yeah. Hey, could you go back to the slide with the example on it? Or with the what? Sorry. To the slide with the final example on it. This one. Yeah. So. This, like, it looks really good, but one problem I have with the declaration of parse in there is that I can't tell what type of error it throws. It's like, if I'm going to define my own functions, I might want to throw my own error categories. Has there been any thought to adding to the throws declaration something like the old throw declarations where you say, I th throw potentially these types of exceptions? So where is the old throw declaration today? <laughs> Dead and gone. But that, that sort of tells you everything you need to know, I think. Well, so um, then you're like, I have no way to tell what type of errors this could no, possibly I, I, throw, right? Is there anything? I know exactly what you're asking for. Uh, and it does amount to um, checked exceptions in the sense of specifying the type of an exception, uh, which, you know, obviously we um, didn't get very far with in C++. They ran with it more in Java, and then everybody stopped using it. Well, Except for a few people who said that that's exactly what they want, and that's the trouble. Uh, it's a small group of people that would benefit from it. They can still use returns of uh, stood expected in that case. Um, whereas here we've decided to optimize for the case where you just want to know whether an, exce uh, an exception could be thrown or not, and then you can deal with the actual exception at runtime. Um, there was an earlier version of the proposal that said maybe we have froze t, uh, and that was voted down for, the, for these reasons. So okay. it has been considered. Thank you. That's, that's the reasoning. By the uh, way, there's still time to change their minds. Um, you mentioned earlier previous talk, and I missed that. Could you tell me what that's called? Uh, optional is not a failure. But those references on my website that I mentioned, that, that's all in there as well. Ah, OK. And also, um, that trailing throws um, keyword, um, you mentioned the optional try keyword you can uh, put before calling a function that has throws at the end of it. 
um, is the idea such that like a, a static analyzer could recognize all the places where a try doesn't show up after functions qualify with throws? Uh, more than that, it would be the compiler would enforce it. Right. So assuming, so it's optional in the proposal, as in we don't have to implement it. But if we do, it would be that if you missed that try keyword there and you, you called something that was throws, it would, the compiler would say, no, you can't do that. Is that specifically because you're inside a no accept function? Yes, uh, not no accept. Um, sorry, this is the wrong example. In a, a function marked throws, mm -hmm. if you called something else that throws and you didn't put the try keyword, that's a compiler error. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So in a couple of days, it's gonna be Monday and we'll be back at editing our code. Um, I guess my question is, do you have any recommendations for what we should be doing now, given that these things are coming? So perhaps specifically, is it worth re-engineering or taking exceptions that we're throwing now and replacing them with the C++ 11 facilities because that might perhaps be closer to what's coming and then the eventual transition will be easier? So I think the first step is to be aware of what's available. So you know, raising awareness of um, stood error code is good. But it doesn't mean that all cases are going to be appropriate. There's no one size fits all currently. That's what we're hoping this is going to be. We're not quite there yet. Uh, but the other thing I hadn't mentioned as another alternative is um, boost outcome. So boost outcome is it's a bit like stood expected, but it's actually much closer to, uh, to this proposal implemented as a library. So it's got some extra macros for handling the effectively the try keyword. Um, and it's also got some extra performance tweaks to make it more like what we've been talking about here. So if you really want to get, get as close as possible to, to P0709 today, um, first of all, use Swift. But if you have to use C++, um, use, you know, well, at least try boost outcome. It's, it's not perfect, but that's another option. Um, but you know, don't, don't shy away from exceptions where they're appropriate and you, you don't mind the cost, because that's still the primary recommended way of doing error handling in C++ at the moment. So one more question. I just noticed that, that you're ca we're catching here a specific type, the stud error. Yes. But if, we, if we're doing all this type erasure with domains and virtual functions and all that, isn't, uh, uh, isn't that the case that then the only thing that we can catch is stud error? Why, why do we ha even have to type it then? Or, or could it be that we could throw and catch in this new mechanism something else than stud error that doesn't have these domains and type erasures and all that? Yeah, so there's, so there's two parts to that. One is that um, because we said we can interoperate with, you know, today's dynamic exceptions, you can have calls to uh, to functions that may throw a dynamic exception. You can have extra catch blocks that catch those exceptions as well. So we need to distinguish between them. Um, yeah, maybe a, maybe an empty catch block would be sufficient. But then you've got to have a an undeclared name, and it all gets a bit awkward. So I think this is this is reasonable. But because this is the value. And it's its value that indicates what the error is. For our purposes, we only need the single type. And we will typically do a, um, a switch or a series of, of ifs, which I think you, you need to do the equivalents. Um, I didn't show that in there because that's still a bit in flux. But um, you, do, you do a runtime check of this specific error type within the catch block. Um, maybe we'll evolve that to actually being able to catch the specific error value. But I haven't seen that proposed yet. So you mean it when we eventually get rid of the dynamic exceptions, theoretically, it could just say catch error without the stud error, right? Because it will always be that type. Um, no, if, you, if you're interoperating with dynamic exceptions, you would have additional catch yeah, blocks. Yeah, but I'm saying if we, if we, when we get rid of, hopefully, the dynamic exceptions, mm -hmm. then all that will be left is stud error. There, wouldn't, there will not be a possibility to throw anything else other than... Right, just say... To say, uh, yeah, okay. um, maybe, but I think we'd need to actually get there first, and we're going to have existing exceptions for many years to come. So maybe C plus plus thirty three or something. Hi. Uh, as far as I understand, in languages like Swift, the E type is something that the user can define also, right? So in the result, there's T yeah. and E. Why was not this chosen also for C plus plus? So if I got your question right, I think that's equivalent to the one we had earlier, yeah. that where we might want to specify a different error type. Um, the proposal as it is, is taking the view that 
you know, checked exceptions was a failed experiment. Uh, all we really want to know is that an, an, error, an error can be propagated and then we'll deal with it at runtime. That is a trade-off and there are definitely cases where you prefer that, that um, more explicit typing. And in that, those cases, you can still return um, stood expected or you will be able to if we get the proposal. Uh, or, or you can roll your own, of course. So you do have the choice, but for most people, I think this is the right default. Uh, and so that's why we've optimized the syntax for, for that rather than for the, the more verbose form. Thanks for the talk. Um, so I'm very excited about this. Somebody mentioned uh, that they're going to go to work on Monday and then modify their code again. Is there anything I and the rest of my team can do to get this in 23, like for sure? Because <laughs> we, like, we do embedded stuff and uh, yeah, I think exceptions so are you, controversial. <laughs> if, you, if you flash mob the, um, the standards committee meetings and uh, you know uh, stuff the ballot, um, no, I think just, I mean, raising awareness in the community of where we're going so we get people talking about it, um, hopefully will make it obvious that people are taking, it's important to people. And that tends to give things a greater priority. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. I think this might be, have to be the last question, maybe. Okay, so it, it kind of looks that if we didn't have this optional try keyword, the one that's optional in the proposal, then this entire example would be very similar to if we if we didn't write the throws, the trailing throws, it would just throw a dynamic exception, right? And we wouldn't know. It it almost it looks very similar to dynamic exceptions. And it seems like it would be easy to mistake to by mistake write a dynamic exception mm -hmm. instead of a static one. That that is a very good point. That um, the additional reason that the try keyword is good is that it actually helps you to distinguish between this form of exceptions and, and dynamic exceptions. Uh, I'll have to raise that one next time this comes up in the committee. Thank you. Got one minute. Uh-oh. Uh, so in the standard, all the exceptions that it throw inherit from standard exception, and that's generally like the practice is have all of your exceptions inherit from std exception. Uh, in this case, now we have a new type of exception which doesn't inherit from std exception, so that kind of breaks a lot of code that catches std exception and says, well, everything else is weird. It's actually more powerful than exception hierarchies. Exception hierarchies are, are fixed. Um, you know, they're, they're a DAG, basically. Whereas, because of the equivalence uh, checking on, on error codes, you can have all these this sort of complex mesh of many-to-many -many relationships between error codes from different domains. And they're not limited to two domains, you can have it across many domains. Uh, and that actually gives you all of the power you had with, with exception hierarchies and more. You've got more flexibility. Right, we, we can talk after. It wasn't about exception hierarchies, yeah. but... Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.